Staff Sergeant Joel Nichols, United States Army, Vietnam. Joel served with the 504th Military Police Battalion in Vietnam, and they were responsible for patrolling the highways in the Central Highlands, Route 1, Route 14, Route 19. And it was a very dangerous job, and as Joel says, I believe that the military policemen in Vietnam are the unsung heroes of Vietnam, some of them. I really do, and I want you to hear Joel's story. It's a very unique perspective. I interviewed Lawrence Prio um, in Indiana years ago, too. He was military police in Vietnam, so a very interesting story here. Uh, we lost Joel in 2017 to cancer. He's 70 years old. I interviewed him in Danuba, California. It was April 21st, 2010. And he, was, he seemed strong and healthy and just a great man. I really enjoyed my time with Joel. And I'm happy to share his story here with you today. Joel served two tours in Vietnam, 67 to 68, where he was with the Roadrunners, the 504th Military Police Battalion, and in 69 and 70. And Joel was a staff sergeant, platoon sergeant, and he was a veteran of the Tet Offensive. So just a great man, a great story. I want to thank Robert Holmes. First time I've worked with Robert. Thank you, Robert, for coming forward and wanting to sponsor a Vietnam story. God bless you. Thank you for your support of my work our veterans, our country, and it's just good to have you with us. I hope we can work together again, Robert. Thank you. Folks, if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, you can do so by clicking the button. You know the routine there. And share these videos, folks. We're living in a day where our freedoms are being taken away from us and our veterans, I think, are rolling over in their graves. You know, the freedoms that they fought for, we've let go so easily in the last three, four years. And and I know that grieves the hearts of our veterans. So we need to fight for them, fight for the same freedoms in our own country today that our veterans fought for. So communism is very real. They fought against it. It's here. It's in this country. That's just the fact. And we just we need to stand against it and be on guard. And as the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association model says, keep America alert. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Yes, I joined the Army in September of 1966. Okay. And where did you go to basic training? I uh, went basic training at Fort Ord, California. And from there I went to uh, advanced training at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Graduated from advanced training in uh, February of 1967 and went to Vietnam for first tour March 1st, 1967. So you're in high school, what, 64? Uh, I graduated from high school 64. What, was Vietnam even a word that you heard at the time? Did you hear anything about Vietnam? In 1964, Vietnam was a very minor issue. I was inclined to uh, be interested in military matters. I was aware of it. Most people hadn't heard it. Indeed, as you probably remember from all your, you know, you've studied the history all the time, that uh, originally uh, Laos was the big uh, news item. What was happening in Laos was, was big. Vietnam was kind of a side issue. Uh, and then certainly Vietnam's coming into more in the news uh, with the, uh, the uprisings of the, uh, the, uh, that we're having there and the internal strife. It was on the news more often than you might remember in 63. Uh, uh, the DM was overthrown and uh, there was uh, a lot of news about that. But Americans weren't really all that involved. There was a lot of American units there. Most of the Americans that were involved people never heard of. It's, Again, you know from your studies, you're, you are a historian. Uh, Americans were flying in Operation, what was it, Farm Gate or Farm Hand at the time. Uh, they were flying the B old World War II B-26s and they were flying the A-26s uh, with the Vietnamese in the aircraft with them, nominally with the Vietnamese being the pilot. But uh, other than that, Americans weren't involved. Uh, then the Gulf of Tonkin, Tonkin incident came about and uh, there was a, a couple of airstrikes 
uh, against North Vietnam, but uh, up until now in, in high school, none of that had happened yet. Well, in basic training, though, was the talk of we're going to Vietnam yes. and you're gun ho and you, you're full of piss and vinegar and you're going to go conquer the world? I mean, is that kind Yeah, of well, pretty much, yes. As a matter of way it worked out is uh, with an attack at Pleiku initially and other places, of course, in March or February of 65, then the ground troops were sent in and in large numbers in, in March of 65. And so by 1967 or 66, when I went in the Army, the Vietnam War was big. It was a, it was a major issue. It was being talked about in high school. I was out of high school, but I was in college, and uh, there was a lot of discussion about it in college. The, uh, the attitude when I went in in 66 was much different than what it was later. What you, in your study of history, what you need to understand is that certainly Vietnam War was different things to different people depending on their job, especially where they were. But more than anything else, it was based on time. The attitude and the war prior to 1968 was completely different than that after 1968. Uh, the army changed, the war changed, because America had changed. So nothing was the same. So the men that went in in 66 were kind of last to the old school. This was a group of people that uh, in elementary school had jumped under the desk into duck and cover drills. Uh, they were the ones that had sweated it out in high school in 62 with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and the Berlin Crisis, never knowing when the war, big war was going to start. And it was well understood that the communists were the enemy, that they were out to uh, conquer America, bury America. And uh, the, well, they might, their fathers had all served in World War II, uncles had been in Korea, kids on the playground from that generation didn't talk about, are you going to go into service, but what branch are you going to be in? So this was the group that went into 66. Uh, even the ones that were drafted, a lot of them weren't happy about being drafted, but for the most part, it was, it was an attitude of, hey, what's, my time has come, I'll do my duty, I'll do my best, you know, after all, we've got to stop them. We'll go get them and we'll get out. And certainly by that time, by 66, the war was, was building up dramatically and in basic training, yes, that was, Vietnam was all the big talk. Everybody, now almost none of the sergeants had ever been to Vietnam yet by 66. The first groups that had gone in in 65 uh, with the uh, large units were just coming home in 66. So very, there were very few Vietnam veterans. There was one drill sergeant, two drill sergeants that were Vietnam vets. But uh, most of them had never been there yet. Uh, it, it was a fairly new war, except for the advisors that had been there prior to 65 and the aviation people. But so, yes, it was gung-ho. It was, it was, we're going to do our job. We're, gonna, we're going to win. Let's go get them. Now, uh, in advanced training, for example, the men were so proud to be in uniform that when they went home for Christmas leave, they went to the PX and they bought every imaginable ribbon or swinger for their qualifications to wear that uniform home. Now, by 1970, if they were going home on leave from a military base, they'd take the uniform off and hide it and they'd wear a wig so nobody would know they're in the service. So what was your job in the military? I was a military policeman. And indeed, that's one of the very reasons that I decided to come here. I agreed to come here today. My first year, I was uh, uh, what, what's called a road runner. I worked the roads. And these are kind of the, uh, uh, I, I, I can't, I, I use this phrase unsung heroes. Because I don't want to use that because that puts myself in a category. I'm certainly no hero. But certainly one of the most misunderstood or one of the most overlooked groups that ever was, uh, that nobody's ever heard of them, nobody has any idea what they did, and uh, you know, they've never really gotten their due. They're not in the history books. You're not going to find them in any history book. Even the history books written by the uh, trucking units that talk about the uh, gun trucks and the ambushes on the road, they rarely even mention that there was MPs there. And yet, this was uh, really quite a unique job. Where did you, when you first went to Vietnam, where, where did you end up over there? All right, went to Vietnam, and I ended up in Play Coup mm -hmm. with B Company, the 504th MP Battalion. And when they offered us the job choice uh, of what we wanted, I immediately volunteered to go on the highway, be on the road. I, 
had met a couple of men from highway and transit up to the company and had been so impressed by them that there's no doubt that this was what I wanted to do. So when you first arrived in country, what do you remember about the sights, the sounds, the smells? What do you remember? Well, you've, you've heard this from everybody. One of the first things that hits them is when they get off the airplane, uh, you go into this steep spiral in the aircraft landing in Vietnam, and uh, they start decompressing the aircraft, and then the heat and the humidity hits. And you step out of the aircraft, and then there's the, not only the heat, but there's the smells. And then on top of the smells, which are always there everywhere, uh, just looking around and seeing this place where everybody's carrying firearms, seeing uh, the sandbag bunkers, just the reality of this is it. Uh, there's, there, there's people are going to get killed here, and I've got to try to get through a year. Uh, certainly this hit, you know, hit hard with a lot of people. So as an MP, from the start you were an MP? I went in as an MP, yes. And uh, as I said, I got there, I volunteered for the road unit. In our company, we had a platoon that did town patrol, regular traditional MP duty. We had another platoon that uh, did uh, the gate guard, traditional type MP duty. And uh, then we had the highway platoon. And what they did was anything but traditional. In fact, it was a job that none of them at that time had ever been trained for. Did you, were you out in harm's way all the time? Yes. I mean, Tell, me, tell yes. me the first encounter you had with the VC or the okay. Vietnamese. Well, the, the, the unit, that's the thing about, about highway. Let me, you, you're probably not going to want this or use all up and tell you a little bit about the highway. There was convoys that carried all the supplies. Convoys had to get the supplies in. There was one road into the Central Highlands up from the coast, Highway 19. You saw those pictures I gave you. That's not much of a road, but that was it. That was the road. It climbed up through mountain passes, it went through the jungle-covered mountains, it crossed across the highland uh, plateau, and all of that was hostile territory. And every morning there would be convoys would start up the road carrying supplies and unload, and all through the day there were empty convoys heading back down toward the coast. This went on all day. So the MPs, we would, uh, about oftentimes before sunrise, we would be out at the uh, convoy forming point. As soon as the road was cleared, they would have had engineers make a sweep of the road for mines, but certainly they didn't catch them all. As soon as that was cleared, the convoys would be cleared to go on the road and we would start the patrols. We had one patrol of two armor-plated gun jeeps that covered about a 25-mile stretch out to what we call Checkpoint 95 above Mingying Pass. We had another two gun jeep patrol that covered from there to the base of Ming Ying Pass and beyond, and about another 20 miles. And then we had one sergeant's patrol that covered the entire road. These jeeps were uh, the jeeps that had been designed to carry the 106 millimeter recoilless rifles, so they had extra suspension. But they slapped 1,500 pounds of armor plate on them, so they had armored walls, armored sides. The driver and senior man were somewhat protected. The gunner was completely exposed. Some of them had sandbags on the floor. Some of them didn't. And uh, the job was to, on that road, not stay with the convoys, but just patrol the road, respond to any problems, and uh, just protect the convoys as best as possible. Now, every convoy that came over the road had vehicles that broke down. The trucks were overloaded. The trucks were overused. And uh, it was rare to have a convoy pass. I said every, and certainly rarely did a convoy ever cross the road, but what, at least one vehicle didn't break down or cargo was lost. When a vehicle would break down, we would go to the location where that truck was. We would secure it until we could make arrangements for it to get towed to a base camp or on with another convoy, and then we would move to the next one. If there was an incident of some type, we had roll to that. So uh, this was, as I said, hostile territory. And for many months, the enemy activity was somewhat minimal, but enemy act uh, then it, it really increased later on. Enemy activity could include anything from the little jacks that set and twist pieces of uh, wire together into something that looked like a jack couple of inches with each spike, throw handfuls on the road, and you'd end up getting a flat tire. 
That was the low. We had that happen one time. Uh, we got a flat tire from a jack in, in, in my Jeep. And by the way, uh, I might point out with 1,500 pounds of armor plate, the jacks designed for the Jeeps didn't work. So to change the tire, you would have uh, five men from the patrol would lift that Jeep and hold it grunting and uh, shouting for the man changing the tire to finish as fast as possible. So we'd lift the Jeeps by hand and uh, then they'd change the tire. But, uh, and that moved from that, and of course there were mines, there were mines in the road that could be hit, potholes on the side of the road, various places, and there was what's now called IEDs, back then we just called them command detonated mines, in which you might have a large mine placed beside the road. There was uh, sniper fire, there were uh, full-blown ambushes. Uh, a lot of the times, in fact most of the time, the enemy activity wasn't something that would even allow a person to be able to respond to it. A, a good example was uh, one time we were coming down the road on what we'd call the sweep at night. This was quite a bit after dark, heading back toward Play Coup, and just from out of nowhere, uh, enemy machine gun fired a long burst through this sweep of gun jeeps. So all the patrols would be, well, we had two of the patrols together, so four gun jeeps. Fortunately, as you understand with a machine gun, that if you happen to swing the barrel uh, at some distance away, even with a fast firing machine gun, the rounds are some distance apart. So he fired through our sweep and none of us were hit. I had a, one of the rounds, one of the tracers uh, passed between me and my gunner who was about two feet behind me. But so it might just be a burst like that. Another time there was a VC probe on a bridge. This was again also late at night as we were coming in. So we stopped in the dark, waiting for that little firefight to uh, uh, end over the hill. And just as we started to roll, the withdrawing VC fired a burst at one of our gun jeeps. But you know, sometimes it just be a little burst like that. Uh, other times, uh, well, uh, it, like I said, things you can't see, the jacks and the mines. We'd respond to the mines, set up uh, security and wait for the engineers and they'd sweep the area. Uh, make sure everything was clear, then we would assist in getting the uh, wreckage moved and get the convoys moving again. And there were uh, other full-blown ambushes, but there, there, most of the time, though, it was just something that would be fast, something that you really couldn't respond to, other than just trying to secure the area. Uh, you talked about my first action with the VC. My first action with the VC was a non-action. You know, my first week in country, we got to the base of Ming Ying Pass and, and uh, we were waiting to start to sweep back up through the pass. And this was the time of the year and circumstances are such, we were actually going to be able to start in daylight. Helicopter landed, officer got out of the helicopter, ran over and told our patrol leader that uh, there was a, a VC, it may, you know, he saw him up in the pass, they were setting up to ambush as he came back up through the pass. And uh, he says that he didn't know what we could do about it. He says he wasn't going to be able to help because clouds were closing in at the top of the pass. There wasn't, we weren't, we weren't able to get any air support on it. And at the base of the pass where we, we had stopped, it was the end of our patrol territory, there was a squad of infantrymen, had a couple of bunkers there where they guarded a bridge. So we had the option of spending the night there or taking our chances. I was brand new in country. I didn't have any uh, choice in the matter, but the uh, senior men agreed to try to make a run for it. And what they wanted to do was they were going to wait until after dark. And then with lights off, they were going to try to make a run through up Minging Pass in the dark and see if they could run the ambush. Of course, I didn't know any better. I figured, hey, they know what you're doing. If that's what they say, sounds like a I'm sure it must be okay, uh, which is certainly quite uh, something I look back on and consider, well, I don't know if it was or not. But fortunately, there was a tank that had bust, uh, broken down and lost a tread, lost a track. And they had been working on it, and uh, they got it repaired, and our sergeant, who was uh, the senior man present, he went over to the uh, tank and talked to them about the situation. They said, well, they didn't want to wait down at the base of the pass for the night either. And so we all agreed to wait till dark and uh, the tank led us up the pass. 
And so with lights off, us and the, the tank in the lead, we were rolling up through the pass. But just as we got into the pass, the uh, tank fired canister around into the hillside and cut loose with his 50 caliber. And every couple of hundred yards he would do that. So the ambush that was there just faded away. So my, my first uh, encounter was a non-encounter. We didn't know they were going to fade away, you know, as we were driving through the pass with the walls of the pass as close as from here to that door. And uh, Ledge is looking down into the Jeeps. We had our guns fully elevated, trying to uh, see if we could see a silhouette and the enemy above us. But we got through, got to the top of the pass, everybody turned our lights on made the dash for home. Okay. Did you lose any friends over there? Were you over there? Not my my platoon had a very no. I, well, I, I lost some high school friends that were there uh, at the same time I was, but they weren't in our unit. We had a very interesting situation. We were able to get by that entire year without losing anybody in combat. Now we had men that were medevaced out from uh, traffic accidents, which was another hazard of the road. Uh, M151 Jeeps were famous for rolling, notorious for rolling over. And we had 1,500 pounds of armor plate on them. It made them even more top heavy. And circumstances were, we frequently, most of the time, were over the uh, speed limit for M151s. And we'd have Jeeps roll occasionally. And we had a couple of men medevaced out uh, from injuries. If there were no injuries, we had just right the Jeep again and jump in and take off and be on our way. But uh, with all the activity, we were, my platoon was involved in ambushes uh, in which there were in excess of probably 50 American casualties. Uh, involved in, these, in these, some of these ambushes to where there were uh, all together, as, as I remember, right about 70 VC counted and you know, the body count. And nobody in my platoon was ever hit the whole time I was there. Now, there were men in the, in the, on the road were hurt after I left. Uh, there was a couple of men that were killed. Uh, there was uh, several of them that were wounded later on over the years there in that platoon on the road. But it was a, it was a remarkable situation. Uh, the, with that particular platoon, sometimes the, the, the men would be in fights to where it would be at extremely close range shooting it out at almost point-blank range with uh, the enemy, and yet none of the guys were ever hit. So, yeah, we were very, very fortunate uh, during the year I was there. So, so Now, we had a couple of men in the company during the Tet Offensive were wounded. Uh, a couple of good, uh, one of them, a good close friend that was wounded during Tet, and a couple of other men from the company were wounded during Tet, but out on the road, uh, we never lost a man killed or not even wounded, uh, other than from uh, the, the vehicles rolling over or going off the edge of a cliff to rolling down a hillside. Did you ever see the movie uh, Forrest Gump? Yes, I did. Remember that little segment in Vietnam? They were over there in Vietnam and they were going through the field, and then the enemy opened up fire. Does that somehow visualize with the elephant grass and stuff? Is that kind of what it was like when it started to rain and, you know, all this stuff? Well, in, in some ways, yes, in some ways. You know, there's a lot of the movies I've seen, and in a lot of them, uh, there's certain things that uh, we could relate to in them. Yeah, that uh, in, in some ways, uh, that's the way it was. But, uh, yeah, a lot of confusion, a lot of noise. Now, one thing that you saw in that movie, and you know, certainly if you've seen some of the other movies, Platoon and such, that was certainly the case. Often, often as not, we'd never be able to know what we were shooting at, never see what we were shooting at. Uh, the men that were involved in a lot of the fights, so, you know, they, they had people they knew they hit in some of the big ambushes. And I'll tell you right off, I'll tell you straight out, that... I, I was cold enough, sick enough, and came close enough to dying to where I can sit here with good conscience, but I was not in the two biggest ambushes my platoon was involved in. So I can talk with some uh, knowledge of this. I might, be, might have been right down the road. I might have been involved in a radio relay with them or whatever, but, uh, but yes, uh, so far as the confusion, so far as oftentimes not being able to see what we're shooting at, maybe muzzle flashes, maybe noise, maybe movement in the grass. And uh, yeah, there's some, you know, there's just a general confusion and oftentimes not even seeing the enemy. 
Did you have uh, transports in the Hueys yourself and your platoon? No. No, the Hueys are always pictured uh, as being the thing of Vietnam, with Vietnam. I worked the road. I worked the road. We were in gun jeeps. And we also had a V-100 armored car, which later on took over the, uh, all the security for the road. We were around the Hueys a lot. We were involved. We had the Huey gun uh, ships were involved uh, in some of the ambushes and some of the other activities. We saw them, you know, making strikes along the side of the road. Certainly, our main involvement with the Hueys was the times when we'd call dust off, call from medevacs. Uh, they might be from uh, traffic accidents. Uh, might be Vietnamese that were injured in accidents uh, involving American vehicles, and it might be from uh, enemy action, mines, or whatever. But we would uh, be involved with the Hueys when calling in dust off. A um, couple of questions. Why, why do they call it a dust off? I, I have no idea. Okay, that's all right. Uh, um, did you help with any of the dust offs? Like yes. Load the wounded? Or? Well, I, no, not so much as loading the wounded. I was involved, I was there, I was present, uh, you know, and uh, so far as helping, assisting with the call, making the call, uh, as far as I remember it, even in, at least in one case, probably popping to smoke, but uh, if not physically doing it right there uh, with it. But no, not, uh, not in uh, assisting with any loading at any time that I remember. Some of the men in the platoon certainly were, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, we certainly had plenty of them on the road. We had the enemy action, but like I said, there was also a, a lot of the traffic problems too. That by traffic, understand this, we're, this was mountain roads. This was a long way from anywhere, but there were still civilians that would travel the roads. They would travel in buses. But the Vietnamese buses, they would be packed to the point to where there would be people hanging on the outside of the bus. There would be people sitting on top of the bus. Uh, and so if you had a situation where one of those rolled over or one of those uh, hit an American vehicle or got hit by an American vehicle, uh, you'd have a lot of badly injured people. So this was miles from anywhere. This was, you know, this was out in the, out in the mountains. We, you know, there, were, there were elephants around. There were tigers there. You know, that's, this was way out in the mountains, but there were still these buses. And occasionally, you'd have Vietnamese that would brave those mountain roads and limbrettas, little three-wheeled vehicles that they'd have packed full of people. And occasionally, those would uh, run afoul of an American truck. So, yeah, it, there was other things other than the enemy out there. But we call, them, we, we, we call the dust offs in for the accidents and for the uh, other incidents as well, the mines and such. And you were there one tour or two tours? Two tours. I was there two tours. So you, did you even come home between the first and Yes. Time? I was back with my, uh, uh, my wife and I were in Germany together for about a year and a half before the second tour. And you were married at that time? <laughs> yes, I was married when I went in the Army. You guys write letters back and forth? Oh, of course. We wrote a lot of letters back and forth. And I, in fact, I've received the inf word of my first daughter being born uh, while I was out on the road. Platoon uh, lieutenant called us called me on the radio and, and told me about the daughter being born. So were you married in 65 or 66? We were married in 65. Wow. So everything he's telling me is true, huh? <laughs> Have you ever told your story much? Uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote a book about it. Did but you? yes, but uh, That's right, you told me that. Uh, I don't think I did. I you, it, you, no. you had a book. Maybe I did an email. I didn't. I didn't remember mentioning it. But anyway, yeah, oh yes. As a matter of fact, I uh, have at different times given talks to various groups and talk about the unit. I'm very proud of the unit. They had faced a lot. They were in a lot of action. Had a tough job. I talk about these roads, and this is, you know this is boring. People want to know about all the you know the face to face, the uh, violent encounters and such. But I understand about the guys on the road that one, it was very uncomfortable in the, in the warm season. You had the dust clouds. You're always in dust clouds behind the convoys. You're you're always in dust, and uh, the face. The men would have uh, mucus when you cough. It would be the color of the dust. We had running sores in our throats. Had uh, no telling what in our lungs. We had running sores on our nose. We had sores on our noses. Sores and scabs from the dust and the dirt. Uh, the faces would be covered by the dirt when uh, the gunners wore goggles, oftentimes. And you could see, oftentimes, on the face, kind of like a farmer's tan, but it would be dirt. And it became part of the skin. Now, during the monsoon season, 
from the time we left the barracks until the time we got back at night, we were in the rain all day. And, uh, you know, the, the skin would be rotting. You could take your hand and roll it on your arm, and the skin would roll off. Had sores all over from that, and the skin turned kind of an ugly, ugly brown from a combination of the dirt and rot. Uh, most all of us had uh, some sort of various types of jungle uh, rot. At, at one point, when I was hospitalized with a bad infection, uh, I, the doctor said that, uh, I had uh, three types of jungle rot, and I was a walking bacteria. Mm -hmm. And this was pretty well the case with a, a lot of the men on the road. We had intestinal uh, ailments. We had various other ailments that we worked with, uh, wet. And I talk about heat when we first arrived in the country. And out, out in the road in the central highlands, we were cold. We wore field jackets most all the time. In the monsoon, we wore them in the winter. And we were uh, soaked through to the skin most all the time. Driving down the road, 40 miles an hour, 45. Uh, we, we'd look forward to leaving Vietnam so we could be somewhere where it was warm. And so you, know, you, you had that, and then you had bridges to wash out. You had the roads to be covered with mud. The roads would be so muddy and slick, you'd see convoys wearing snow chains. And... Uh, the problems the guys dealt with. with. For example, you have a bridge washout. Well, how are you going to get the convoy through? One of our men was smart enough to figure it out. The engineers built the defile, but it was too slick and muddy. Have a truck winch them through one at a time. So you'd have a tank tow them, or you'd have a truck winch these convoys through. So there was a lot of things that the guys had to deal with. But then having the mines there, and even just having the occasional snipers, and then having the ambushes there, you never knew when it was going to happen or where. So it was a case of being keyed up and tight all the time. And uh, it might well be that a guy would go a couple of weeks, nothing would happen to him, but another patrol would get shot at. Another patrol would work a mining incident. And so you all knew the road you went over had mines. So, so everybody was tense and, and kind of tied up in knots inside, sometimes without even knowing it. Which tour was the most difficult, first or second one? Second. Why? Because the Army had deteriorated, the war had deteriorated, and I almost never talk about the second tour. This the thing I will tell you about it, I was extremely proud of my unit, my first tour. And I normally wear a hat that's a Roadrunner patch, the patch from the unit from the first tour. But second tour, I, I worked town patrol which is not a bad thing. You know, certainly by that time we needed to have the enforcement, we needed to have uh, the uh, regulation because the Army was falling apart, although I wanted to be back out on the road the whole time, which I could have been, but the Army was deteriorating. Everything, the whole attitude was different. Everything was, uh, everything was different. Uh, it was by the second tour, like I mentioned, by that time, uh, men going home on leave, instead of wanting to wear their uniform and their ribbons, uh, they might well uh, put on a wig and hide their uniform so nobody would know they were in the service. Whereas the guys that were there in 67 uh, were part of that last group that figured, well, we've got to fight the communists, we've got to stop them, and this is right. And uh, uh, the guys that were there in 70, 71 and such, these were, these were men that had been drafted uh, after the Tet Offensive. These were men that had been drafted after the, the culture had changed in America. The, the culture that was the dominant culture of the young people in America in 68, 69, was the culture in Vietnam. The, the anti-war attitude, the anti-authority, the anti-military attitude, uh, all of this was part of the culture of the guys. Uh, not, not everybody was like that, of course, but of a large portion of the draftees in Vietnam. Uh, so certainly we had a lot more incidents with, uh, the, as, as an MP, we, I was involved in incidents uh, the where there'd be the uh, oh, action, people fighting against their superior officers with various types of uh, riots on the rear area bases. We had the, the fragging incidents uh, going on. It just the whole attitude was completely different. And uh, it wasn't, a, with most of the guys at least, it, it wasn't an attitude like it was with the first tour. We rode to the sound of the guns. On, on the road, we'd hear gunfire. We'd immediately roll to it. Uh, now, the guys that worked the roads, by the way, second tour, a lot of them still had that same attitude. They would, 
But uh, a lot of the attitude in the second tour, and I must say it even affected me by the end, was uh, who wants to be the last to die for a lost cause? So the, the phrase, an unpopular war, that something you hear about Vietnam. Well, yeah, well, it, it was unpo unpopular because it had changed here. The attitude had changed in America. And then so the men that were drafted and sent over in 70, 71, they took that attitude with them. Now understand this, by the end of the tour, even the guys that were in 66, 67, had a different attitude than when they arrived. If, if anything, there was still a sense of, yeah, we're gonna win eventually somehow, but there was a lot of frustration with the Vietnamese, with the Arvins. There was the sense of, we've come over here to help these people but they're not willing to help themselves. They're not helping us. Now, some, this might well be unfair because after America pulled out, there were undoubtedly many Arvin units that fought, uh, served well, and there were many uh, people, Vietnamese, that were very anti-communist. But to give you an idea of, of what I'm talking about, first arriving country, first tour, as we'd go out on the road and pass through the villages, the people would line the road, waving and cheering, America, number one, number one American, you know, and cheering. And, all the new people, uh, certainly uh, I, I was this way, first day on the road thinking, man, this is just like the pictures I've seen from World War II, you know, that, boy, they love us here, they're so glad we're here. Uh, after a week or so, I understood they were out there begging, of course, they were out there waiting for us to throw them sea rations, which uh, frequently, you know, the guys would do, especially for the kids, where they might grab up a little child and hold up the child, you know, number one, you know, chop, chop, baby's on, somebody throw some sea rations. but. One time, there, we got off the road early, and as we would come off the road, tanks would make a sweep behind us. And for this particular day, for some reason, the last convoy got off early. So we passed through early. The tank behind us passed through right after it turned dark. We got through in daylight, and there was an ambush set. It was either for us or it was for the tank. Don't know which, but the tank caught it. They blew a track off the tank. The tank. Uh, killed five of the VC, and uh, and reinforcements came out from a fire base. So anyway, this tank was ambushed. It killed five of the VC. Uh, they dug a quick hole, buried them at the roadside. Well, for the, and this is all within a couple of miles of one of those villages. For the next several days, as we had passed through that village, the people were sullen. Nobody, everybody would glare at us. And it was, so it was obvious that the men were from that village or that they knew the men from the village or supported them. Uh, but then after a few days ago, or after a couple of weeks at least, it's back to GI number one. You know, they're out there asking for the sea rations. And, and, and a lot of times, when men, the Americans being tender-hearted, they'd give Vietnamese sea rations. And in some cases, they'd take those sea rations, sell them on the black market, some cases to the Viet Cong. Viet Cong would eat them. Then they could take those cans and they could make mines out of them but the, the men would still give them to them. But the, so the people, uh, the men realized this after a while. We look at this and say, wait a minute, we thought these people liked us. But the, all they want is the sea rations. They actually hate us, that the men from that village were the Viet Cong. And then we have our, our trusted allies, the Arvins. One day we were escorting a couple of VIPs with a, one of our patrols. And an Arvin convoy, Arvin Vietnamese Army patrol pulled up behind us. Now we had a speed limit of 35 miles an hour officially, which with an escort we had to keep to. We had these VIPs. So this Vietnamese convoy was behind us and we could not break integrity on this escort. And so we wouldn't let them pass us. There was some sort of an incident on the road ahead, so we all had to stop. And when we stopped, the Arvin commander walked up to us, to the rear jeep, and he demanded to pass, and we explained to him, well, now the road's blocked ahead. Nobody can go, and he said he's going to go, and he pulled his pistol, and he had the men in his first truck point their rifles at us. Well, by that time, our patrol leader had walked back. I was a senior man in the second Jeep, but my gunner turned his machine gun around on the Arvins, and the uh, patrol leader raised his uh, grenade launcher, and you know we were facing off against the Arvins. And then we got the radio call that we could move out again, and it kind of broke the standoff. We started rolling, and they stayed behind. But these were these were our allies. These were the people that we were trying to help. These were the ones that we were there for. In fact, just before I got there, uh, there was a, a couple of bunkers where our men worked a defile. The Arvins that were stationed there attacked our men. We had a firefight with the Arvins, 
And these were the people we were. So the men would look at this and say, now wait a minute, we're trying to help them. We're here for them, but they don't like us. We're here for them, but we're doing all the fighting. What's going on here? And so there was frustration with the Arvins, but there was still a sense of, well, we, you know, we, we're gonna beat these guys eventually, we're gonna win. We've got to win. Now by the second tour, the men arrived in country mm -hmm. against the army, against Vietnam, uh, against everything else. Uh, by my second tour, just the attitude was completely different. And so, yeah, the second tour was roughest, even though, that I, well, I say I was a lot safer. My second six months, I was at a place called Dongtam, where they boarded us so regularly that we moved into, uh, we moved our bunks into a bunker until one of the men came down with hepatitis, and then we decided to move back into the, uh, the hooches. But we were, you know, we, it was, we were mortared a lot at Dongtam. But... Uh, Anyway, it's a, a situation to where overall it was safer. It wasn't like being out on the road that much, but it was worse because everything was falling apart. Well, getting towards the end of the interview, I need to ask you a couple of questions. Was there a, a homecoming for you when you came home? No, no. Well, yeah, I got, it was a homecoming for me. Yeah, uh, well, of course, other than my family. Homecoming for me, uh, other than with my family, at, at the uh, airport in San Francisco. Uh, we, we, I ran into a man there that had been in advanced training with me. We had been in Vietnam together, and he had taken an earlier flight, and we were ran into each other at San Francisco Airport. As we were walking, there was a couple of oh, what would be described as hippies passed, one guy wearing a buckskin jacket, and they kind of looked at us and snickered. We kind of looked at them and snickered. We didn't realize what had happened back here in America, and we thought they were just amusing, and they thought we were amusing. But then we went to a... You know, get a, something to eat, and we were eating a hot dog, and uh, at a little house hot dog stand there at the airport, and uh, a man in a business suit in his forties came up to us. He asked, "Are you are you back from Vietnam?" And we turned around and says, "Yes, we are." And uh, he stuck out his hand. He says, "I want to shake your hand." He says, "I want to say, I'm glad to see you home." He says that he was at the airport. He was on his way back from Japan. He said he was able to get to Japan in time to. His son was a helicopter pilot, and he was able to visit his son in the hospital before he died. His son had been shot down in Vietnam, and then at that point he broke into tears, and then he again shook our hands and said, I'm glad to see you back. And so, yeah, that's the main thing I remember about that homecoming, and then, of course, the very happy reunion to get back with my wife. You heard me yesterday at the school talk about freedom. You know, what does freedom mean to you? What, is, what does freedom mean to you, Joel? Oh, that's too complicated to just put right here just in a, in a small little package. But, uh, well, it, it means just that. Of course, there, w without moral restraint, there can be no freedom. Uh, you, you certainly cannot have, a, like with the Constitution when it was created, one of the founders pointed out that without morality that it wouldn't work. But freedom means just what it means, that uh, a, a person can choose their course in life. They can choose where they want to live. They can choose uh, their career based on their ability at least, or at least try whatever it is that they want to try. Uh, marry who they want to marry, just freedom is, it, it is freedom, but uh, it is something that is not in a lot of places. Tell me what the American flag means and represents to you as a veteran. Uh, it represents the country, it's always meant it, but even before I was a veteran, it, it represents the country, it's extremely important to us. Uh, to me and to all of us as veterans, it uh, kind of represents what we did and it represents what the people before us did uh, all the way back for the last couple of centuries. Uh, very, it was very important to us. There was a brief period, this is not what you want with your question here, but one of our lieutenants got a, a notion that it would be nice if we raised a flag over a bunker we had uh, out about 30 miles out on the road. And uh, he came up with a large pole, and we put that American flag up, and it was during the monsoon. And when it first went up, we looked at it, and everybody felt real good. It was bright and beautiful. Everybody felt good. But we said, it's not a good idea, though. It's not going to work. And then after a few days in the monsoon, it started to turn red with the mud. Uh, the wind was whipping at the tatters. The rain was making it just cling to the pole, and after a few days, they gave up on it. And everybody 
was very, felt, felt, well, I'd like to say, can't say everybody, but I know there was a general feeling of sadness about seeing the flag, uh, you know, in that condition and the fact that it hadn't worked, even though everybody said it, it can't work out here. Are you proud to be a Vietnam veteran? Yes, I'm very proud. I believe that the, the, the cause was yes, that whatever happened to the war, it was a matter of how it was handled, how it was uh, managed, and not whether or not it was right to try to stop them, not whether or not it was right to try to win. And the one thing that I would say, and, and hopefully not slop into your next period of time, is if there's any one thing that I would want to have clarified by everybody, is the misconception that America was defeated in the spring of 1975, was driven down to the coast, and left the country. This is a great misconception most people have. There were very few Americans left in Vietnam in 1972. The treaty was signed in 1973 in January. The last of the American soldiers withdrew in March, and by April of 1973, the war continued for two years, and when the war ended, we had already been gone for two years. We were not defeated in battle and chased down to the coast and escaped onto ships. They see the pictures from the embassy. That's the uh, civilian employees, the CAA people, other people leaving. And the Americans that were there were the ones that were sent in merely to assist with the evacuation. The American military had left by treaty two years earlier. How does it feel when people thank you for serving your country? It's nice. I'm, I'm, good to, I'm glad to see that attitude. It's very, very embarrassing. I was very surprised and somewhat embarrassed yesterday. I was, was reluctant to go forward yesterday when you asked us to go forward. It's good to see that attitude. Uh, it's, it's almost a, a very rare attitude in the country again now. Uh, actually, I guess it's better now than it has been certainly for decades, but yes, it's, it's nice to see that, not, not thanking me, but it's nice to see that people appreciate uh, what the people have done. One more question. I think you kind of answered it with your, what you just said about the war being over in 73, you know, for us and all that, but what, what, what should our country remember about Vietnam? What they should remember about it was, that there was, that there had been the promise by the communists that they would bury us, that we were engaged in a worldwide struggle at that time, and that it was right to try to stop uh, the expansion. It was right to try to keep the North from taking the South. Uh, these things were right. Uh, there was a good, now, the fact that it might have been mishandled, the fact that uh, politics and uh, possibly bad policies uh, might have caused, fouled it up, doesn't change the fact that it was uh, right to begin with. President Johnson said in 64, 65, that, uh, I can't remember, this it has to be paraphrased, of course, but something along the line of the communists have to understand that we cannot allow them to use force for expansion. If we allow it in one place, we're going to, have, we're going to see it somewhere else. So sooner or later, there has to be some action taken to show that, no, this is something that's unacceptable. Now, whether or not they mishandled it, that's another matter. But whether or not it was right and initially, to try to show, hey, we're not going to allow this. Now, that, that's a different subject altogether. One more quick question. Have you been back to the Vietnam Wall? Yes, with my unit, with the guys from uh, my outfit in 67, been there twice with them, and my wife. When you went back the first time, what did you feel or experience? Well, it's really quite all everybody feels. It was very emotional. That was primarily it, just very emotional. Anytime Vietnam comes up, anytime thinking about it, anytime talking about it, uh, at our annual reunions, most of us are, are, are quite emotional. And there's, are there sights, sounds, and smells that bring Vietnam back to you today? Today? Different times today? Well, certainly sitting in that theater yesterday, uh, watching that film with the lead-in part with the sound of the Huey, and then having it getting louder and louder, and then suddenly having the radio squawk come in, that, that physically affected me. I was hit physically with that. 
and I well imagine others are too. Now, no, I didn't ride the Hueys into action, but like I said, when we dealt with Hueys uh, and heard that sound getting silent uh, and then louder, it was usually involved with the dust off. And so certainly that's just, you know, and then the radio squawk and sort, you know, the radio traffic and such. Uh, that uh, certainly affects me and other things can as well. But, uh, Vietnam movies, uh, books about Vietnam, certain things come up. But, yeah, it can uh, it affect me and it can affect me for days. At the beginning of that video yesterday, they showed the story that CBS did about my work. Right. If you remember in there, there's one segment where the, the announcer talked about the salutes. So how I asked the veterans to salute at the end of the interview. Is that something I can ask you to do for me? I'm somewhat reluctant to, but yes, I will, I'll do it, sure. Just if you saw one of, one of my films, you would yeah. understand how I do it. It's a good send off, and it's it's done very gracefully. So uh, I, I, yeah, why not? I mean, I, you know, I, I salute a dozen of times every parade, every time the flag goes by. And you're not you hand salute. So let your comrades. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Excellent.